Hello, MCU fans. Today, we're going to take a look at the Hulu and Freeform shows and where they fit in the overall MCU timeline. Now, in particular, I'm talking about Cloak and Dagger, Runaways, and Hellstrom. And don't worry, if you've never seen these shows, you can still watch this video because I'm going to avoid any spoilers. I mean, I do have to talk about general plot lines, but nothing that moves into spoiler territory. In fact, my hope is if you've never seen these shows, then watching this video will encourage you to go check them out because they're great, especially Cloak and Dagger and Runaways are fantastic, and, and Hellstrom is still worth your time. It was only one season before it was canceled, but it's enjoyable. So with that in mind, let's dive right in and see what we can find out. Okay, so as I do quite often, I want to say quick thank yous to the Marvel Cinematic Universe wiki, which goes down to the day that everything happens in all these shows and, and, and the MCU in general. It's amazing. And footnotes, so you can look at why they made their decisions. Also, there is a Discord for the wiki if you want to check that out. And Robbie and Drew, love you guys. Couldn't have done this video without you. All right, so this is the last of my videos on the Marvel TV shows prior to Disney+. Plus. So I want to kind of remind us about something that Kevin Feige said about these shows, because there's lots of debates on whether or not they're canon. But Kevin Feige pretty much answered that question back in 2014, October of 2014. There's a video, you can go check it out online, full Marvel Studios Q&A with President Kevin Feige about MCU Phase 3. And uh, by the way, it's the last question he's asked. So if you don't want to watch the whole video, go to the very end. And he's asked, is there room for the Defenders to show up on the big screen in the Infinity War movie? He answers, there are a lot of people from the movies in Infinity War. Then he kind of goes off on a bit of a tangent, but he lands the plane and says, all of those things, and now he is referring to the Marvel TV shows, inhabit, however far out on the outskirts, the same continuity, so certainly that opportunity exists. So basically he's saying, yeah, some of this stuff doesn't tie in a lot to the movies, but it's all the same continuity, i.e. canon. So as far as I'm concerned, that's our answer. I mean, I think these things were all filmed with the assumption they were canon. Kevin Feige says they're canon. Now, he may change his mind. We may find out with the timeline book coming out later this year that they're no longer canon. But until that happens, I kind of take the assumption they are canon. But let me stress, this video is not trying to convince you one way or the other. I just wanted to lead with this quote so you have it in your mind. Because honestly, whether you believe they're canon or not, it's kind of fun to see where they fit in the overall timeline. So, all right. You've seen that. Um, I did say, you know, this is the last of the videos on the pre-Disney Plus Marvel shows because I've now covered everything on this list. All 37 seasons, 468 episodes running from 2013 to 2021 and across so many different networks, ABC, Netflix, Hulu, FX, Fox, Freeform. My goodness, they were everywhere. Um, By the way, I said I covered everything. Let me be clear though. The bottom two, MODOK and Hitmonkey, I've talked about them in previous videos, but I'm not going to go over their timelines because they're absolutely not canon. Marvel has made that clear. They're fun to watch, but they're not canon, so there's no point in going through a thorough timeline. But I have covered them in previous videos. Okay, so without further ado, let's dive into the uh, Freeform and Hulu shows. Okay, as I've done in the past, uh, I've got the MCU running down on the left-hand side, and then on the main part, uh, we'll see... um, the Hulu and Freeform, in fact, in this case, starting with Cloak and Dagger season one. Now, the reason I don't try to integrate it all into one image is I think it would just look like a giant bowl of spaghetti. I mean, honestly, these shows barely touch on the main MCU. They have some Easter eggs that are cool, and I'll talk about them, but for the most part, they're meant to be kind of contained within themselves. So that's why I haven't done a one massive uh, timeline image. All right, so when does Cloak and Dagger season one happen? Well, I'm going to jump actually to the last episode because they make it really clear. It happens during Mardi Gras. And Mardi Gras is in February, uh, the different times uh, of February, depending on which year it's in. And, and in fact, that's what's important. We don't yet know what year, but we do know season one happens in February. It's a very tight timeline. All the se- uh, episodes of the season are very linked together. It bleeds a little into March, but for the most part, it happens in February. Okay, great. Now I'm actually going to jump to season two. Because doing season one and season two as a pair makes it very easy to figure out where everything happens. So uh, season two, episode two, mentions that the end of season one happens eight months ago because they talk about the time the city went crazy. That's referring to the end of season one. And so like eight months ago? So great, okay. Now we know that season two picks up eight months after season one. 
Season one is in uh, February, a little bit of March, but mostly February. So now we're talking October uh, for season two. Great. Uh, then also, the, here's this flashback to the end of season one again, uh, and it's listed as being 242 days ago in episode three. You can do that math, but that's essentially eight months. So great, they're being really consistent. We're talking about now in October time frame. And then at the end of season two, particularly episode 10, Tyrone, a uh, cloak, uh, mentions, uh, or in a letter at least, he mentions to Father Delgado uh, that uh, he moved into the church nine months ago. This is something that happens at the end of season one, uh, beginning of season two, and so now we know that the end of season two is nine months from the end of season one. So that means we bled a little bit into November, December timeframe. Okay, awesome. Season one, February timeframe, season two, um, October to December. But what year? That's the big question. What year? Okay, here's a big helpful hint from Jeff Loeb, who was in charge of all of Marvel TV. That dude was amazing. Um, at SDCC 2018, he talked about the stories happening before Thanos snap. Because by 2018, we're getting real close, you know, to him having to explain what's going on, right? They've seen Infinity War, hopefully, and they know there's a snap. So, you can see down below, he says, the short answer is that the stories you're seeing, unless otherwise noted, all happened before the Thanos snap and will continue to be in that place until we find out what happens in Avengers 4. So they hadn't even revealed the title yet, apparently, at this point. Uh, and of course, that, that's Endgame. Anyway, he says, because we don't want, what we don't want to do is tell a story and then in Avengers 4, something else happens. Very wise move on his part. And that's basically saying, hey, we're staying out of the time after Infinity War. Infinity War is in May of 2018. So that pretty much means Cloak and Dagger season one and two is not in 2018, right? Because remember, the second part of the se uh, season two is in October to December. Well, that would put us past Thanos snap. So by the way, I also think, and, and, and Jeff Loeb keeps up this, these comments. Notice in uh, Reddit, I love that he was in Reddit uh, making comments. Notice he says again, for the most part, our stories will take place before Thanos clicked his fingers. A lot of that has to do with production and when we're telling our stories versus when the movies come out. So hang in there. And he says, I remember in the comics, one of my favorite stories was the Kree Skull War, which was universal. But in X-Men, no mention. Hmm. And it all worked out in the end. So you can tell... A little bit of frustration there on his part, which I understand, because it, it, it was a pain probably to have to keep telling stories that were being released after Infinity War, yet happened prior to Infinity War. But nonetheless, that was his goal. And I do think ultimately that's what hurt the Marvel TV shows is we're going to see some things did have to happen after the snap. They had to. Uh, so we'll, we'll get into that a little later in the video. But nonetheless, this helps us know Cloak and Dagger season one and two is not in 2018. Awesome. Okay, what else do we know? Well, uh, the actress that played O'Reilly, who's one of the best characters in the series, definitely, um, moved to New Orleans, which is where Cloak and Dagger takes place, right before season one. Because we can see here on the wiki, it mentions that uh, she was a detective. She worked in Harlem. Of course, that means uh, we're going to see a tie-in with Luke Cage, so that's coming up. And then she moved to New Orleans. Now, you might say, okay, this isn't enough, though. Show me the, show me the reason they're saying this, right? Well, I would love to, because in the footnote, they say that the actress said that season one is right after O'Reilly moved from New York to New Orleans in a video. So let's go see the video, right? So we can see the proof, and darn it, it's been marked as private. Oi. So trust me, the wiki would not make this up. At one point, you could view this video, and at one point, the actress did say that she had just moved from New York, uh, from Harlem's in particular. Anyway. Just letting you know that, because this does help us place it a little bit, but there's more that actually we can look at. So in season one, episode eight, O'Reilly says she used to work in New York, right? So we're canonizing it here. And she knew Misty, referring to Misty Knight, one of the great characters from the Defender shows. She says, I'm from New York. I've seen it before. I ever tell you about my friend Misty? Okay, so this means that she would have left New York, Harlem, at a time when she knew Misty and worked with her on the force. Okay, great. So let's try to place this then. And here's what really helps. So the Defenders show, uh, the uh, final, season, uh, final episode, episode eight, happens in May of 2016, which I covered in an earlier video. Something 
really bad, happens to Misty Knight, and she is hospitalized and off the force for quite some time. No spoilers, I won't go into it, but, and she's saying, you know, it's not your fault, it's the job, etc. So, and she's not talking to Bridget, by the way, she's talking to Colleen. But more importantly, we know she left the force in May of 2016, but she didn't know, you know, that um, O'Reilly had left yet. Because when she comes back, eventually, in Luke Cage Season 2, Episode 8, which is in August of 2017, which is in, in the earlier uh, timeline videos, they talk about O'Reilly moved to New Orleans. So first of all, I love the fact that Cloak and Dagger talked about Misty, and Luke Cage talks about O'Reilly. Really cool. It's just the little Easter eggs like this that are a lot of fun. But these Easter eggs also help us definitively place when this occurs, because O'Reilly... Uh, Misty did not know O'Reilly left until she came back, and Misty left in May of 2016 and came back in August of 2017. So that pretty much means the February of Cloak and Dagger season one is February of 2017, right? It's the only thing that works. So uh, thank you to these Easter eggs, uh, Marvel, because you really helped us place things. And then as though we didn't need, or as though, as though you know, we have enough already, but hey, give us one more thing, one more little Easter egg. So in season one, episode 10, we know that it has to be after Iron Fist season one, which is in February to March of 2016, because they make this fun little Easter egg. In this day and age, you need to keep up with the Joneses as well as the Starks and the Rands. Well, he wouldn't be talking about Rand, Danny Rand, Iron Fist, unless he was back and running his company again, which he didn't do until the end of Iron Fist season one. So once again, that means it needs to be in the February of 2017 because it can't be February of 2016. Really cool, right? I mean, isn't it neat how this stuff all fits together? I don't know sometimes whether they just accidentally backed into this stuff or whether they planned it out, but this really works well. Okay, so what do we know? We know Cloak and Dagger season one runs from February into just a little bit of March of 2017. And then eight months later, remember, eight months later, it picks up and runs from October to December of 2017. Okay, very, very cool. Love it all. Fits so perfectly. Because remember, the, the letter Tyrone wrote was nine months later. So that's why we know it's in December. Okay, one last fun little thing before we move to Runaways. In season 10, or sorry, episode 10 of season two, there's a fun little Easter egg that may well be dovetailing into the plot of Runaways, Runaways season one because they talk about Bridget uh, said a bunch of us girls, a bunch of girls, sorry, were found dead on the beach. So as you'll see, if you watch Runaways season one, there are some girls that turn up dead on the beach and presumably Cloak and Dagger are heading to that location, which is Los Angeles, by the way. They don't say, they kind of hint at it, but it's a little wink and a nod of, hey, let's head to Los Angeles. And that's important because we are gonna see Cloak and Dagger show up eventually in Runaways in a really cool crossover. So I love this. It's just a little little hint that maybe things are tying in. So also this may help us you know, cement in when Runaways season one happens because Cloak and Dagger ends in December of 2017. So let's just see if maybe this all fits together. All right, Runaways season one. So what do we learn? Season one, episode one, Alex is playing Star Wars Battlefront. Because why not, right? <laughs> but uh, it's that was released in November of 2015. Why is that important? Well, because we see that Amy has not played in two years. Okay, and by the way, I can't really go into a lot of that. Uh, just trust me, it's important why uh, Amy and uh, why, why she's going to fit into everything. So I want to avoid any spoilers. But anyway, Amy has not played in two years. Well, if it was released in November of 2015, that places it at least in November of 2017, right? Because, it, because she hasn't played in two years. And remember, Cloak and Dagger ended in December of 2017. All coming together, right? Pretty cool. Okay, also we learn in episode two of season one that Chase is going to college next year. And this is his senior year in high school. Well, if he's saying next year, then we're still in the end of a previous year. We know it's after November of 2017. Now it can't be any later than December of 2017. We've narrowed ourselves really down to uh, basically two months. Pretty cool. Okay, this is fun. Uh, Leslie's computer in episode two indicates the day is Friday the 8th, because when they first log onto the computer, you can see the eight there, and it's uh, highlighting a Friday. But then they do go ahead and zoom in a bit more on this calendar, and it starts to get funny, actually. Anyway, there is a Friday the 8th, in December of 2017. So that actually works. So it does look like we're talking December 
But we also can only go so far with this calendar. Notice he's, he, he, he moves through several days, and now he's on the 11th. But here's the thing. I believe it's December, therefore, but notice that Thursday the 31st, up there at the top, implies that the previous month, November, had 31 days. Well, that doesn't work, right? Well, there's much bigger problems than that. What is, what is up with this? <laughs> what? Did someone just not look at this uh, image before they went live with it? There's two 29s in a row, and then next month apparently jumps from the 4th to the 29th. I've actually never seen something that off in something this visible. I didn't zoom and enhance. This is pretty much the screen you're looking at. Oh, man. So my point is, I think we can trust the fact that the 8th is on a Friday, because it seems like that's what they were focusing on. But I don't think we should be worrying about the fact that there's 31 days in the previous month, because... They just messed up anything that wasn't relevant uh, to this calendar. So anyway, bottom line is, I think now we know it's in December, not November, of 2017. Okay. (laughs) Anyway, got to love that image. Okay. So then we also learn in episode four that Jeffrey Wilder has bought a new 2018 planner. That works perfectly. That's what you would probably do in December. So we're really focusing on December of 2017. Uh, also, this is kind of fun. Episode seven includes a flashback to 25 years ago. And it's worth noting that Reservoir Dogs came out in October of 1992 because the students are talking about Reservoir Dogs. Did you see it yet? It's so good. Well, 25 years, remember it's a flashback to 25 years ago, would move us to October of 2017. Um, so that works perfectly because probably people are talking about, uh, or, or at least uh, October of 2017. Could be, could be later than that. And very likely it is more like a December of 2017 because the movie's been out, people are talking about it, hey, have you gone to see it, etc. So this is just one more thing to point to a December of 2017 um, for season one. Okay. Uh, then they also talk about the fact that they haven't yet applied to college. Remember, uh, they're in their uh, high school senior year, and he's talking about, hey, we're going to have a really good essay for college applications. That would again make you think we're probably talking December timeframe because they haven't done those applications yet. Okay, and then I think the biggest thing is uh, episode 11 talks about a non-holiday specific seasonal dance. (laughs) You gotta love it, right? We don't call it a Christmas anymore. (laughs) It's now the non-holiday specific seasonal dance, which whatever, I I don't care. But yeah, clearly they're talking about a, a dance happening in December. So, okay, I think that really answers our question that this is in December. So then also uh, to let us know about how long things covered throughout the, this uh, first season, uh, they've talked about you've been lying, uh, been lying to you, th- sorry, they have been lying to you for weeks. That's the kids. The kids have been lying to their parents for weeks. And also they've been conspiring against you for weeks. So I'm only bringing this up to say, you know, it pretty much encompasses all of December, uh, the, the season. So Okay, we've seen so much proof that it's December of 2017. And again, that's really perfect because remember I was saying episode one deals with someone showing up dead on a beach. And sure enough, in Cloak and Dagger, they're heading somewhere, most likely to where the runaways are, to check out someone who showed up dead on a beach. Wild. It all all comes together. All right, so season two. What do we know about that? Okay, season two, episode one, starts 24 hours after... um, Yeah, season two, episode one starts 24 hours after season one ends. Because notice they're saying uh, they found the kids 24 hours later. So, okay, great. That means it picks up in December of 2017. Then also, much later in in the season, uh, uh, episode seven, Nico references season one events started two months ago. Because she says, I love it, two months ago, our biggest issue was that there were no vegan options. (laughs) Um, So... Basically, that means that the uh, season two runs over the span of two months. Okay, we really don't need much more. This this is locked it down with just a couple great references. So that means it runs from December of 2017 to February of 2018. Very cool. Okay, how about season three? Okay, also worth noting, this is when finally Cloak and Dagger show up. Now, I think they moved to Los Angeles uh, because they heard about the the issues uh, there at the beginning of Runaways season one. So they've been in Los Angeles for a while, but they do finally show up uh, in season three in a really cool crossover, which we'll get to. Okay, season three. 
Episode one lets us know that it picks up 36 hours after the season two finale. I love how they're helping us know all the time frames between the seasons. I noticed they're saying 36 hours ago in a news report. Okay, what else do we know? Well, episode five is pretty wild. They end up in the dark dimension. I'm not going to go into why. You know, you have to watch it to see, but it's pretty wild. And they end up being there for six months. Because when they come back, uh, and this is all in episode five, when they come back, uh, they notice that Alex's computer has not been backed up in six months and 22 days. And he was religious about backing up his data. So, okay, they've been gone for six months. And in fact, then they say it flat out, we've been gone for six months. All right, so that means that uh, we know that season three spans from the end of season two all the way to six months afterwards. And then also Dale, another character in episode six, confirms this because he says it's been six months since season two's finale. But of course, he says it in a more specific way, day 189 of living off the grid, which you can do that math, but that's essentially six months. Okay, great. And then episode eight is the one where we get our Cloak and Dagger crossover, which is really cool. To see all of them together and to tie the two shows, it was amazing. Uh, it just kind of pays off everything. All right. Uh, so we know, therefore, that it starts right after uh, season three, starts right after season two, so in February, and then jumps six months later, so we're in August. Now, we remember earlier uh, that uh, jo uh, Jeff Loeb said, hey, we're going to try to avoid anything after uh, the snap. But, you know, by the time this final season was out, they kind of had no choice, I guess, or, or they weren't paying attention <laughs> to what was going on. But notice we are a little bit past the snap because we're in August of 2018. But that isn't, that's not the end of the world because we did see that near the end of the run of Marvel TV, several things were after the snap. Uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., all of season six, and parts of season seven were after the snap and the epilogue to The Punisher uh, is after the snap. Now, actually, that's the one I think makes the most sense because I do love the idea of The Punisher not getting blipped and running around, you know, fighting bad guys. There would have been a lot of people trying to uh, make some money dur during the blip. So that's kind of cool. But anyway, yeah, I wish Runaways didn't move into uh, the timeline of after the blip, and we're going to see why that may be more of an issue as things go on. But nonetheless, I wanted to point out there are a lot of things near the end uh, of the run of Marvel TV that were after, after the snap. Uh, okay, get rid of all that. All right, now, I didn't really finish <laughs> season three yet. Oh, man, here we go. Oy, episode 10, the final episode major league time travel. And no, I'll just tell you up front, does not even remotely follow the end game rules. So all right, let's dive into this. So it opens with Chase uh, on June 14th of 2028. So actually, this is, I think, one of the farthest scenes that we've seen into the MCU, uh, besides like Loki at the end of time and some of the craziness in the Loki series. I mean, we're talking about something in uh, the year 2028, which we're not there yet, obviously, in the MCU. But nonetheless, it opens with Chase uh, at that time frame, and he decides to time travel back in time. So it's a time jump to 2028, let me be clear. Just we're seeing something in 2028, no time travel yet until he decides to jump back in time. So he jumps back in time to three years since uh, season three, episode nine, the previous episode. Because they talk about, oh, is, it, is today uh, the anniversary? It's been three years. And they're kind of sad, which I can't talk about why, <laughs> but something bad happens in episode nine. And, you know, it was three years ago. So if you remember, uh, that ended in uh, August of 2018. So we're in August of 2021, three years later. That's when he's jumping back in time. And we know that it's late in August because school is going on. You know, they're talking about, hey, we're really going to miss you when you graduate, Molly. So Chase jumps back in time to August of 2021. He then talks to the team and says, hey, now we're all together going to travel back in time to December of 2017, basically a day before season one even starts. Not going to go into why. You'll have to watch to see why. It's a pretty wild episode. I don't like this type of time travel, but I will admit it was a fun episode. It's pretty crazy. Anyway, so he says, who's ready to go back to high school? So he's grabbed them. He, he goes back to 2021 to get the team <laughs> to then take them back to 2017. Oi. So after the, and, and clearly they're not using endgame rules because he says, don't interact with your past selves, right? Because 
Uh, he says, I have no idea what type of time paradox that could create. Well, according to endgame rules, it wouldn't create a time paradox. You're, you're creating a branch. But nonetheless, clearly that's at least not what he perceives to be happening, but it doesn't seem to be what the episode implies either. They are definitely using back to the future type logic. Okay, so after they finish things in 2017, he then says, we're now going to head to August of 2018. So back to the, when I remember I said something bad happened in episode nine of season three, they're going to go fix that. And Alex is saying, hey, hey, you don't want to do that. You don't want to mess with time because the lives you have right now, they'll all be erased. Oi, ouch. I mean, that's so not endgame rules. So not endgame rules. Nonetheless, um, he says, hey, you can go try to do it, but if we jump to August of 2018 and we intentionally try to change the, the, the past, you're going to erase your current lives, and you, so you better do it right. <laughs> Ugh. Okay, so let's talk about this. I'm not going to try to solve it all here today, but I do want to throw out some interesting stuff here. So we have seen many, many examples of time travel in the MCU. Of course, I've alluded to Endgame many times. I love Smart Hulk explaining, hey, if you go in the past, it becomes your new future. And therefore, you can't change your old future because your past is your new future. Which, I don't know how else to say that simply, but you create a branch. The only way you're the only way you cannot change the future when you go in the past is if you're not affecting it. So you create a branch. I love the branch logic. It's so simple. It, it just easy, straightforward. However, <laughs> we've seen in Infinity War where the time stone allows you to rewind time, right? You're definitely going in the past and changing the past. I mean, Thanos did it. Doctor Strange did it in the first Doctor Strange movie. Remember, he rewound time a couple times. So obviously the time stone works differently than quantum physics and, and, and the Hulk's uh, time machine. But all he's really doing is rewinding time. We do see in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., they use the time monolith to pretty much go back in time and seemingly alter things. I'm not even going to try to get into all of it. You can watch the video on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., but the time monolith seems to work differently than quantum physics in some regards. So they do later create a branch, but I'm more concerned about season five. Season five is very confusing. They seem to rewrite the past in season five. But then we saw Miss Marvel used her bangle to go back in time. Now, it turned out it's a closed loop, they explained, because she had always done it and always been there. The bottom line is she went back in time and changed it. So we can call it a closed loop to try to make ourselves feel better about it, but it didn't seem to use the end game rules. Now, of course, we're seeing Chase using uh, it's a watch device in this case, but to go back in time, clearly changing the past. But then again, we got Deadpool right? Deadpool 3, that's going to be the TVA going to check out why Deadpool's doing what he's doing. And a cables device, another watch device, interestingly, kind of. But anyway, it is allowing you to clearly change the past. And then in days of future past, which by virtue of Deadpool coming into the MCU kind of canonizes all of the X-Men movies, I guess. But they used phasing powers, uh, um, uh, to, to send his consciousness back in time. Uh, Kitty Pride did. Okay, I, wow. I mean, <laughs> this is a lot of different things going on here. Uh, maybe there's more even that I've missed some, but wow. I, obviously, I'm not going to solve it all here today, so don't worry about that. But I want to bring up the fact that kind of other than Endgame, every other time that we've seen time travel, it rewrote the past. So I'm beginning to wonder, will the multiversal power core that we saw in Quantum Mania, will that provide some answers? Because there's been hints that it will let Kang go back in time and change the past. We're going to have to see. They haven't said that, but there's been hints at that. When he talks about giving Janet more time and burning people out of time, but, but particularly giving Janet more time, letting her relive things. It could be talking about branching, but maybe it's talking about literally rewriting things. If so, okay, then maybe quantum physics that Smart Hulk tells us about creates branches. But maybe some of these other things are all based on elements of Kang's device. Who knows? I mean, who knows? Anyway, something to keep an eye on. I wish they hadn't done it, though, in Runaways. I mean, maybe they're going to end up decan decanonizing certain things because of this. I mean, maybe they say Runaways' final episode, that, that just didn't happen. We'll have to see. Anyway, 
Just throwing this all out for people to think about. Interesting stuff. There may be some other potential continuity issues in Runaways uh, that I want to talk about. One of them, though, has been solved. So we the dark hold shows up in Runaways. So which initially made people go, wait a minute, how, how is the dark hold here? It's also an Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., I, uh, I should mention, and it's also in WandaVision. So how on earth is it in all these places? How does it keep moving around? Who, who Who's giving it to who? Well, they actually solved that in Multiverse of Madness because they said the Darkhold was a copy. And he's referring to the Darkhold that was destroyed in Multiverse of Madness. But it is a copy. Well, if it's a copy, all of these could be copies. And then they talk about that the actual um, true Darkhold, the inscriptions, are found on um, Mount Wondegore. So that's kind of cool. Whether Multiverse of Madness was trying to help solve this potential issue in Runaways and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., I should mention, uh, I don't know. But they did. They solved it. So there's just multiple copies of the Darkhold. Great. My bigger concern, and it's not a concern yet, but I'm just bringing it up proactively, Morgan Le Fay appears in Runaways. And there are at least rumors that Morgan Le Fay is going to be one of the villains in the Agatha Coven of Chaos series. I don't know. Just something to watch out for, to keep in mind. So I'm just bringing it up now. But also, man, you got you to gotta give credit to Elizabeth Hurley. I'm pretty sure she's 50, at least 50, uh, years old when Runaways came out. And my goodness, can we all look that good at 50? She is she is a boss in, in, in the episode she's in. Just a fantastic villain. So yeah, way to, way to go. Way to age well. Um, okay, so um, let's put these time jumps then. I may not like them, but let's put them on our timeline here. So not time travel, but we literally move forward to June of 2028 um, to, to see what's up with Chase. That's obviously well after Endgame now. We're, we're way in the future. Then he jumps back in time to August of 2021 to pick up the team, the runaway team, so they can jump back in time to December of 2017. Notice that's around the same time because there's one day before the beginning of season one. And then they jump forward in time to August of 2018, which of course is uh, the end of um, season three, episode nine, so they can fix what happened in that episode. Boy, my goodness, time travel. Yay. Okay, so let's close this thing down finally with Hellstrom. This one won't take long because I'm going to mention right off the bat that they say it appears to be non-canon. Uh, in fact, it's not even on the wiki yet. There's some references to it, but it's not on the wiki yet. And I don't know if that's because they don't plan on putting it there or, or, or not. But regardless, in this article from Screen Rant, they basically say, the producer, we are not tied to the MCU. We are our own separate thing. And then the last sentence down there at the bottom, there's Easter eggs for the show, or, or, or they're, but they're more towards the Hellstrom universe and the Ghost Rider universe, because they were going to do several uh, shows. Uh, it was going to be Hellstrom, Ghost Rider, and some other things, which unfortunately they all got canceled when Marvel TV was shut down. Um, but nonetheless, they're pretty much saying it's not canon. But okay, just for the minute then, if it if we want to see where it falls in the MCU, it's still worth the time. So let's let's see what we can find out. I'm not going to go into great depth because they pretty much said it's not canon. But nonetheless, in episode three, they discuss a case from 20 years ago. And the newspaper article tells us that 20 years ago was October of, 20, of 2000. So we're kind of saying then present day would be October of 2020. Um, so that works. Uh, we'll go with that. Uh, then also we see this that says uh, there's a pain med uh, label, which by the way, I should mention the reason there's a nice close up of this. One of the things that was really cool about Marvel TV is they sold off a lot of their props. They, they didn't try to hide dates. They wanted you to see them and know what they were. That was really cool. I mean, sometimes in the MCU, the main MCU, we got to dig for these dates. They do not let us know when things are happening, but man, the Marvel TV, they were proud of it. <laughs> so anyway, this is a close up of a prop from uh, episode three, it's a pain med that must be used by 318 of 21. Well, that fits well with present day being October of 2020 because you know your pain meds might expire by that point. So we know it's gotta be before 2021 at least. All right, uh, also there's a newspaper article on the president's reelection concerns. And if you can read any of this, you're better than me, <laughs> but I'm gonna zoom in 
and it's over on the right-hand side under that current column. It says, U.S. diplomats arranged a briefing last week uh, with outside experts who warned the president that trade tensions could imperil the economy and hurt his re-election bid. So uh, obviously the election is in November uh, of 2020, assuming elections are the same in the MCU as they are in the real world, but I, I presume so. So a December, I'm sorry, an October time frame works just fine because they're warning him, hey, you got, you got an election next month. You better fix this now. Um, all right. So there you go. We're going to go with October of 2020. That's enough. Um, although I will point out when we talk about some of the Easter eggs referenced in the movies, here's kind of a fun little one in Hellstrom. One of the newspaper articles talks about the Sokovia Accords. Um, so that's cool. So therefore we know a Hellstrom is post-Civil War, but that's really clear because it's in 2020. All right. So October of 2020. There we go. We've now got the Freeform and Hulu shows in their own timeline. I will place this timeline on my Google Drive. I'll also put a pinned comment uh, that has a link to it in case you want to download this image. Uh, and then also on my Google Drive is a spreadsheet with everything. So while my images, I'm not putting everything in the image because it's just craziness to try to do that, this spreadsheet has everything. Uh, notice it has uh, a column called type there, the third column. That's to let you distinguish between am I talking about an MCU movie, am I talking about a one-shot, uh, Hulu, Freeform, etc. Uh, there's the title, when it was released, the month and year, and where it fits in the timeline, and then some notes. And then notice over on the far left, there's a release order and a timeline order, so you can sort either way. So one of the cool things I did too is I did break out any post credit scenes that should be watched at a different point in time, just so you knew where they fell. Um, and then because I do have both timeline and release order, you can go and sort it. You can choose how you want to sort it because some people don't care about timeline order. They want to watch it in release order. Great. Go for it. Sort it by release order and you'll be set because it will let you go back and forth. And then also if you don't want to see everything because there's a lot in this spreadsheet, then you can create a temporary view and you can choose what you want to see. And notice you could choose in this case just to see uh, Hulu Freeform if you deselected the other things. And in fact, if you did, there you go. There is just the Hulu Freeform shows, Cloak and Dagger seasons one and two, Runaways uh, seasons one through three, and of course Hellstrom season one. And and again, how, how nice and neat they all fit in together. Well, except for Hellstrom, which is kind of its own thing, but Runaways and Cloak and Dagger all really fit together well. All right, so go check this thing out if you want. You can download it if you want your own copy. But yeah, 147 rows so far. And I'll keep adding to it. There's not much left to add, but um, I do want to add that the, the final video I'm going to do, which is not uh, Marvel TV, but I'm actually going to do something on all the news ads, Daily Bugle, WHIH, uh, even some stuff from Rising Tide. That's going to be in a final video on um, you know, things that aren't TV, but are more like YouTube videos. So that, that should be fun. Anyway, I'll keep adding to this as time goes on. And lastly, we do have the Discord server. I'd love to have you join over 500 people on there across the globe. So there's always a conversation going on 24-7. Uh, also, if you don't mind, you can like this video, subscribe if you haven't already, check out more content, and we can all continue to enjoy the ever-growing, ever-changing, ever-timeline-altering Marvel Cinematic Universe.